I'm Andy Asher, and welcome to the very first episode of Let's Talk Food, Travel, and Live Squared. Our guest this week tells her incredible story of survival and later in life to the hallowed halls of justice. In our travel segment, we are heading to the Isle of the Arts, a tiny community on the Gulf Islands way up in the Strait of Georgia, British Columbia, Canada. And in our food segment, we'll be checking in at Mimi's Kitchen, where she is cooking up something totally yummy. But first, I want to give you some background on why I started this live stream show and what you can expect by joining me here every single Tuesday. You know, I've wanted to create a show for a while now. I personally watch and I listen to, no exaggeration here, three or four podcasts and shows each day. Like when I used to take my beloved Duke on long walks in the morning, doing chores around the house, working out at the gym. I've been doing that for years now. It's all about what I like to do, and I'm really excited about having the chance to be that person you can tune into every week and get so much value and inspiration. It is scary, really. I'm just kind of going with the flow right now. I am doing what I've done so many times in my life. Yeah, dive in head first, get better as you go, and improve, figure it out as you go along, right? <laughs> Our first season is Let's Talk Food, Travel, and Live Squared. I get asked about the Live Squared a lot. The answer is, it's good either way, live or live, because we can stream the show live, and it's about to live an authentic life, live life authentically. Now, let me introduce you to today's guest. Uh, first, today's guest talks about trauma, abuse, about hitting rock bottom, a junkie addicted to methamphetamines, started drinking at 12, abused by a mother and a stepfather, survived by luck and white privilege. She tells a searing, unsettling, and ultimately triumphant story. In Mary Beth O'Connor's debut memoir, she takes readers on a wild ride through the rock bottom underbelly of intravenous drug addiction to the hallowed halls of justice. My first drug, which was alcohol, when I was 12 years old. And I moved on to meth by 16, was shooting meth at 17, and I did not get sober until 32. In a moment, Judge O'Connor shares her intimate details of her early life of drugs, high-risk survival, and triumph. Hi, I'm Mimi. I'm here in the kitchen today making some wonderful couscous salad. So I steamed my uh, whole wheat couscous. I steamed it and it's all cooled off now because it's a salad, so it has to be cold. And I soaked some uh, garbanzo beans and then cooked them just in a uh, uh, little bit salt water. And I'm gonna use it. I prepared some uh, red onions and I pickled them. They are, you know, better to digest. You know, they're easy to eat because they're not as uh, pungent. And then I have prepared some uh, green onions. I roasted some uh, red, um, uh, ro uh, red peppers. I roasted them, then I cleaned them and cut them in little pieces, diced them. Kalamata olives, artichoke hearts, cherry tomatoes, uh, English cucumbers or Persian cucumbers, and then some fresh basil. So, what I'm gonna do is, uh, oh, sorry, and I made also a sun-dried tomato um, dressing with just sun-dried tomato, a little garlic, olive oil, lemon. Very nice, and of course, never forget the lemon zest. So, voila. Thank you, Mimi, we'll be back shortly. Let's start today with travel. Now, for six months last year, I spent traveling the Gulf Islands in the Strait of Georgia in British Columbia. That's where we are heading now. We are at Gabriola Island, British Columbia. After a couple of ferry rides, sometimes a pontoon plane, plus the highway on the west coast of Canada. Here we can look over dense forests of evergreen trees, towering sandstone bluffs, abundant wildlife, and an iconic west coast shoreline, home to a robust community of artists, makers, creators, and innovators. During my tour here of the islands off Vancouver, there's a similarity in many of them. They have skate parks, they have a senior center, a medical center, 
Water and Elementary School. Now, there are a lot of stories about Gabrielle Island. It's often referred to as the uh, Isle of the Arts. It's also considered a place to you know, disconnect from the, uh, from the hustle and bustle of the city. Now, here's what I'm finding. It is just a short ferry ride from Nanaimo. Gabriella is part of the rural Gulf Island with a diverse, creative culture. You know, it's a vibrant community, and there's an abundance of natural beauty, as you can see. It's an easy place to relax on Gabriella, but I am told also, make no mistake, there's plenty to do see and experience. In a land area of about 10 square miles and a resident population of 4,500, it's a tiny place. As small as it is, Gabriola Golf and Country Club is popular as it boasts tranquility and nature accentuated by magnificent views of Hogan Lake, roaming deer and soaring eagles. And back to our tour, I was lucky enough to make a new friend with Monica, who's lived here several years in a transplant and how the island almost mysteriously found her like it has with so many others. I think there are, there are many quaint sayings on Gabriella, and one is that no one finds Gabriella, Gabriella finds people. People here live, work, and telecommute. It's a diverse community of people who practically feel it's an island paradise. So I have the best of both worlds here. I have this amazing island with six provincial parks, facilities like I've shown you of the fire station and the hospital and the shopping center. And for Monica, there is plenty to do to keep her here. But what's kept me here is this, just the magic of Gabriella. We've got everything here and it's a wonderfully, wonderfully close-knit secret. <laughs> From this beautiful spot, Monica and I jump into the car and make our way around the island North Highway to the South Highway and back to the ferry for my return home. But we made several amazing stops along the way. We traveled to the one-of-the-kind site such as the Malaspina Galleries, a spectacular sandstone sculpture that the winds and waves of hundreds yeah. of years have formed into a gigantic wave. The locals and those in the know use it as a natural springboard to leap into the Mediterranean-like waters that surround Gabriola in the summer. Gabriola, for me, is one of the interesting southern Gulf Islands, as if not the most interesting, as we make plans for our next island visit. And I really hope you enjoyed that, and maybe you even want to take a visit. Next week, we'll explore another island where residents travel in golf carts, and they go grocery shopping aboard a tiny ferry boat. <music> Food is really big around here, and a lot has to do with my life partner, Mimi. I am the luckiest guy learning and discovering the meaning of really healthy, savory food. Let's check in with her right now. Hi, I'm back again. I'm gonna put the uh, the salad together. So, but not add, I'm not gonna add the dressing until we're ready to eat it because I don't want it to be soggy. So, let's scoop a little bit of whole wheat couscous. All right, and then a cup of garbanzo beans. Okay. Then you add artichoke hearts, kalamata olives, roasted red pepper. It smells so good. Some green onions, cherry tomatoes, and of course the cucumbers. You put as much as you as you like, you know, so I'm just gonna cut it in two because it's too big. All right. And then some of the fresh basil. I just cut it this way because I don't like to cut it with a knife. It's just nicer. Then you add your pickled red onions. Look at how beautiful it looks already. All right, some pepper, fresh, 
some dried mint. There you go. Put that there. And it's all the flavors of the Mediterranean, you know. Voila. So you stir everything, stir, stir, stir everything here together. It looks very good already. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. All right. And then I love some nuts on my salad. So if you have toasted uh, walnuts or pecans or almonds or pine nuts, you just add them like that, as much as you like. And then, like I said earlier, you know, you can put goat cheese or uh, feta cheese. I like goat cheese because it has less salt. So you just add it like that. Okay, all right, don't have to put a lot. Let me just uh, wipe my my hands here. And <clears throat> see this salt here, I love it. It has a, um, it's violet salt and it has a taste of red wine. So you just put a little bit on top like this. All right, just a little bit. Okay, so when we're ready to eat, I'm going to add the dressing and toss it again. All right, see you later. Thank you, Mimi. See you soon. Today's guest is a former meth addict turned federal judge, Mary Beth O'Connor, author of From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. Mary Beth O'Connor has been a sober person since 1994. She's also been in recovery from abuse, trauma, and anxiety. Six years into her recovery, she earned her law degree from the schools at the prodigious University of California, Berkeley. She worked at a large law firm. Then in 2014, she was appointed a federal administrative law judge, which position she held in 2020. Mary Beth is now director of She Recovers Foundation and for the Life Ring Secular Recovery, and I am pleased to talk with her right now. Mary Beth, I'm so excited that your memoir is coming out and you're here to talk with us today. Mary Beth, uh, my opening question is I, I ask all my guests is, uh, you know, what is your origin story? But it, it feels like uh, maybe in your case, the answer is uh, strap on the, the seat belt and uh, get ready to, for a wild ride. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, how would you describe your origin story? I say the short answer is that child abuse led to childhood addiction. So I, my mother really wasn't bonded with me and she could be violent, but the real problem arose when she married my stepfather when I was nine, who was very violent with her, violent with me, physically, sexually violent, and just the kind of situation where you never knew when it was going to hit you. Um, and so that really created sort of a, a vulnerability and a stress that led me to pick up my first drug, which was alcohol, when I was 12 years old. And I moved on to meth by 16, was shooting meth at 17, and I did not get sober until 32. And I've read everything I could get my hands on since I learned about you. And I, I want to tell myself, you know, yours is one of those uh, one-off stories, but my better sense tells me that there, there are other girls like you. Uh, Am I wrong? No. I mean, the truth is that people with trauma histories have around a four to six times greater likelihood of developing a substance use disorder. About 20% of kids suffer child abuse, 25% uh, actually, and 20% of women have had some kind of sexual assault. In my rehab, which was a women's program, I would say 90% of the women had some type of trauma in their background. Well, I guess everyone reacts differently to similar situations as yours, but one thing that stood out in my mind is so many who have experienced the kind of abuse as you would have, uh, wouldn't, they're, they're hard and bitter and angry, but I don't see that in you, even during the abuse from your mother and men, you, you didn't resort to crime and ruthless behavior, um, you know, I guess meth, but you know, our society is filled with hatred from people who have experienced what you did. Does that make any sense to you? 
I mean, you're seeing me after many years of therapy and many years of healing. When I was a teenager, I did have anger. I was lashing out. But the truth is that most of my reaction, most of the harm was to myself, which is not uncommon, particularly for women. And so I would put myself in dangerous situations. I picked up drugs, poor choices with boys and men. Um, but there was definitely an underlying anger and rage that I had to resolve when I got sober. How did you come to terms with that? You had to, you know, bury your soul in the world and uh, in a way. Yeah, I mean, my goal with the book was was multi multiple reasons, but I really wanted to show what early drug use looks like, why it happens, which meant I had to disclose the trauma and other events. And then I wanted to show what the sort of the misery of the addiction is, but also the hope, the possibility of recovery, what what recovery really looks like, that it's not a light switch, that it's not, you know, it doesn't happen instantaneously. It's a process that usually takes many years so it was a decision to become open and to be willing to talk about pretty much any aspect of my life because I want to use my story to provide hope and reassurance and a path forward for others. I'd love to hear your view on the uh, on the criminal justice system and, and policing and the double standard for white people and people of color. Yeah, I wrote an op-ed that was printed in the LA Times about two months ago that got reprinted talking about my white privilege, that the one time I got arrested, I was treated very lightly, that the last 10 years of my using, I had drugs on me every day. And even when I interacted with the police, I was never searched. So it is true. Uh, first of all, I think, I think criminalizing drug use for everyone is problematic. It's a medical condition, a substance use disorder, and you shouldn't be jailed for a medical condition. Um, but it is true also that people of color are you know, stopped more often, searched more often, arrested more often, and they get longer sentences for the exact same charges, the exact same behaviors as, um, as white people do. And that is definitely one of the problems with criminalizing drugs. Now, you've also talked about religion in connection to the 12-step uh, programs that you uh, reject. Can you expand upon that a little bit? I mean, I support 12 steps when it's the right fit, but it isn't the right fit for many people. And it certainly isn't the only option and it's not even a better option. So a lot of people are not comfortable with the 12 steps or choose other peer support groups because of the higher power slash God aspect, but also because of the ideas about being powerless or turning your will and your life over. There are multiple reasons why people might want a different peer support group. But the good news is there are many options. There's, you know, Life Ring Secular Recovery, She Recovers Foundation, Smart Recovery, Recovery Dharma. Um, there's a place for everyone, regardless of their philosophical beliefs, regardless of what they think will help them best succeed. So part of the title of our show is, is Live Squared and the... Uh, uh, you know, let's talk food, travel, and live square. And the show is live. And I believe, uh, especially in life, we strive to live life authentically. How does that resonate with you? I, I mean, one of the benefits of getting sober, and really now as I'm able to be open about my entire story, it does feel like I'm being 100% authentic 100% of the time for the first time in my life. And that is really a joyous feeling. It wasn't that my friends and, and family didn't know my whole story, but it was really about, you know, at work, you, you reveal this and here you reveal that. And now I'm fully open and it's a really a lovely way to live. How does a child uh, or a teenager escape from a violent, abusive environment? Well, I mean, the reality is that most abuse occurs at home or from people that you know. And so it is important that we have resources and a place, a safe place for kids to turn if there is violence in the household, but also that the parents look out for other adults in their lives who could potentially be threatening um, and have a relationship with the child that if they tell you something, you're listening because a child might not say 
this person is abusing me, they might give you hints and see how you react. And so it is important to be aware of the risk and to keep your ears open. How does someone intervene to stop an addict who rejects help? You really can't make the decision for them. So what I know it's frustrating for friends and family, and I emphasize I'm friends and family too, right? All of us with a substance use disorder also are friends and family. You can provide loving support. You can um, look into resources and have them ready. You can let the person know that when they're ready for treatment, you will help them find it. You will help them uh, you know, maneuver through the system, but you really can't make the decision for them. They can only make it for themselves. And what do you attribute your ability to survive and, and, and thrive actually? I mean, part of it was just pure luck, to be honest. As I was writing my book, it was just a reminder how many times things could have gone even worse. Um, but in the long run for, for my recovery, what I really found helpful was to take control of it and to really make decisions and choices about what was going to work for me. But I also used professional help. I did individual therapy. You know, I was in a group of women with trauma histories, couples counseling with my partner. I did medication. It was really a multi-pronged attack to get my, not just my substance use under control, but my trauma damage, my PTSD, my anxiety, all of that. It took a while and it took a lot of effort. And is there a survival lesson that you would share with others who could uh, face dangers that you experienced growing up? I think that when people have been traumatized, they are more likely to make risky decisions. You don't really see the risk in the same way. And so it is important if you have been traumatized to try to find help as early as you can. First of all, so that you have the earliest opportunity to heal and therefore you, you know, don't have more years of your life impacted but also to help you avoid making future decisions that might actually create new trauma events. And because I did that and many of us that are traumatized do. Well, I've monopolized everything. I want to tell us about your book. So my, it's my memoir, of course, it's called From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. And I do try to cover the whole arc, the, 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 the childhood that led to early drug use, the drug use itself, but 30% of the book is about recovery. It's about how I built a strong recovery foundation. And in the back, there are guidelines and checklists that someone looking at trying to get help or start their recovery path or that friends and family might really find useful. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. That is such an uplifting story, one I will never forget. Let's take a final check and look into Mimi's kitchen. Hello, here, back again. So now we are ready to eat. So I'm going to put my, my wonderful dressing that I made earlier with sun-dried tomato, garlic, lemon, lemon zest and extra virgin olive oil. You just pour a little bit on it, like that. Don't have to put a lot. All right. Some Aleppo pepper. And you have a wonderful Mediterranean salad that has garbanzo beans, whole wheat, couscous, red onions, roasted red peppers, green onions, kalamata olives, artichokes, and delicious <laughs> so good it looks so good and it tastes really good i'm gonna i'm gonna taste it actually mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. that's a wonderful crunch it's delicious mm -hmm. bon appetit everybody Thank you, Mimi, and we'll see you next Tuesday. And thank you so much for tuning in to Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared. If you enjoyed this episode or you learned something new, I want to tell you two ways you can support the show and keep Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared 
going. Number one, get yourself subscribed. Every week I'm bringing on the influencers and the people who can teach you something or have something interesting to share. So take a moment to hit that subscribe button. Number two, this is the ultimate way to support Let's Talk Food Travel Live Squared, and it takes less than a minute. You can write something in a short and sweet way. I like, I love this show. It has changed your life or something you learn from it. I'm not exaggerating that I read reviews every day and every single one, whether short or long, it means everything to me. The more reviews means the higher we rank on all those algorithms, which means bigger guests. So take a minute to leave a review. I am eternally grateful. And thank you so much for supporting this show. I will see you again next Tuesday for another episode of Let's Talk Food, Travel, Life Squared.